Hi, I'm Jack Cush with RoomNow.com. We have on the line two experts in the field of tel telemedicine. Dan Albert from uh, Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire and uh, Alvin Wells from the Rheumatology and Immunotherapy Center in Franklin, Wisconsin. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. Okay. So uh, both of you have been, have been using uh, telemedicine for quite a while. Alvin in practice, private practice, and Dan in an academic center at, uh, at Dartmouth. Um, I'd like to start by uh, Dan telling us how you're using um, uh, telemedicine in your practice, especially this week. So, um, Jack, it's been a very eventful week. Um, as you can see, I'm home, and I'm home because my fellow is being tested for COVID-19, whom I've rounded with for the last two weeks, and I've been sent home uh, to do all of my encounters remotely. And uh, this is not a uh, new thing for me, but um, doing it exclusively from home is quite new. Um, there's been a lot of changes with the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, and most of them, in my mind, have been for the good. You know, they have relaxed a lot of the restrictions. You no longer have to uh, have the patient at an academic or a, a clinic uh, setting. They can be at home. Uh, there's no restriction on uh, the way in which you um, in, encounter the patient. In other words, HIPAA re uh, regulations have been relaxed. Um, they've uh, changed some of the billing so that it's a little bit more transparent. And uh, by and large, it's been quite a bit um, easier to do this, even if you're um, stuck in quarantine, as I, I think I'm going to be. Um, and, uh, you know, the only restrictions that uh, remain are um, the state restrictions where you have to be licensed in the state that the patient is at. Um, mm -hmm. And that hasn't changed at all. Other than that, um, there's a little bit different uh, format and epic for doing these uh, virtual um, encounters, but it's not a huge deal. I think that by and large, uh, most of the changes have been quite, uh, quite um, uh, in line with what we had hoped uh, telemedicine would uh, achieve in the future. So I think if there's a silver lining to, the, to this particular one for telemedicine is definitely a plus. Alvin, how are you using it and what's changed uh, as far as your practice? Of telemedicine. I think Dan is right on some things. So I think you take a step back as a private physician. My goal was, hey, how can I increase revenue? Uh, and I've evolved over the years. We've been doing about five or six years now, going from platforms like HealthTap and American Well and Teladoc into now we use a platform with Epic where Zoom is our connection with the patient. The one big change this week has been the use of telephones. Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of uh, older Americans and even some of the uh, patients of a, you know, a lower socioeconomic status don't have a computer, they don't have internet access, but a telephone call has been really, really been good to kind of fill those. And I can't tell you how many telephone calls we've had and the whole gamut of questions that we all have had. Uh, I think, and Dan is absolutely right, that they've changed the rules now that we can actually bill and code for telephone calls. Uh, CMS has waived the, um, the co-pays and deductible for all televisits. And again, in the past where it had to be at one facility, like a nursing home to a clinic or a hospital to a clinic, now they can be doing it at home, which is very, very, very nice, uh, which makes it really good. The, Dan, I had a question for you. We've been struggling with some of our Medicaid patients. How do they get access? Like I said, they don't have a, um, a internet access at home. Do you guys have a, a, a booth, a cubicle they can go to to kind of log on somewhere at, outside the university? I mean, that's what we're struggling with. How do we get access for all of our patients? Yeah, I think that is a generic, uh, difficult um, situation. We want to protect the providers and the patients from getting uh, infected. And so we have to sort of keep them separate and, uh, and isolated, but many patients don't have access to the sophisticated um, uh, computer access that we require. And, and uh, as you've mentioned, some of these um, programs are quite difficult to, to, um, to manage. So um, in general, we've been reverting to telephone encounters. You know, I don't think that there's an easy way around that. You can't send them to the library. The library has the computer facilities, but they're closed. They're closed, um, right. And, 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 and that goes for almost every place that has, uh, you know, public access. So 
you know, I think we have to live with telephone calls. I agree. So Alvin, you mentioned that you're getting a lot of calls. I'm sure Dan is too. What are the two most common questions that both of you are getting? Let's start with Alvin. Two yeah, most common questions thing. and what's your response? Yeah, the number one thing is, of course, of all the biologic drugs and even methotrexate and the scenario goes, I just answer it once, say, hey, my husband is a police officer and he might have been exposed by someone he arrested and I'm on one of my, these medications. Do I need to hold my, uh, my injections or my pills? No symptoms, no issues at all, no fever or anything, even from the, from the, the patient or from the police officer, but it still triggers a call. And that's been the number one I've seen. And so, hey, I think I, as someone in my family, has been exposed to whomever. And what do I do with, with any of my 15 medication that we prescribe in rheumatology? That's been my number one thing. And I tell them, hey, you want to hold your medication because when the disease is active, the immune system is preoccupied, causing havoc, uh, you're less likely to fight an infection. So I think that's where we need more guidance from ACR and others so to get the message out you know, globally. Dan, what's the most common question you're getting? I, I agree. That's the most common question is whether I should continue my medications. They ask for uh, very, sometimes very sophisticated questions. Should I be taking ibuprofen? Right. Um, should, I, should I add hydroxychloroquine to my regimen? Uh, you know, and variety of other um, nuance uh, issues. But by and large, we've given them the same answer. If you're not sick and the person that you think has has uh, has exposure uh, is not sick, then continue their your uh, biologics. So I would uh, refer our um, room now audience to uh, one a tweet that I put out today from the American Academy of Dermatology. Uh, the ACR is coming out with its information in any day now. The AAD came up with its guidance for patients, and they say do not stop your biologics. Unless, of course, the bottom line was, if you are infected, yes, stop your biologics and contact your rheumatologist. Uh, and then for patients, I did a video, I called it a PSA, and it can be found on Facebook or on Twitter or on our website. It's called um, uh, Managing Your Arthritis Medications, and it's like a six-minute video. It's sort of me to a patient about what to do about your medicines, including uh, non-steroidals, Tylenol, biologics, and that, all that sort of thing. Uh, it's a good resource uh, to refer people to because, again, we're getting these questions over and over again. Um, Dan, do you have a question for Alvin? Yeah. Uh, Alvin, you use Zoom for your um, video portion of yours, and you've been able to integrate it into uh, Epic. That's, that's uh, an interesting, uh, I think we use video, V-I-D-Y-O, right. and the interface is a little bit cumbersome, and so Zoom might be a better um, option for us. Did you, did you come upon that um, just by yourself, or was that a recommendation? So, uh, so no, one of the things we did, so learning, I, I always tell people if they want to dabble in telemedicine, they, they should merely become a member of the American Telemedicine Association. So after going for a couple of meetings, you know, everybody's you know, pitching their platform. And then Zoom came out. Of course, I got the t-shirt that says Zoom on it. But when we looked at that, we really wanted something to integrate with, uh, with, the, with the electronic medical record. So in the past, when I had CERN and other ones, I would do like uh, Health Tap or American Well. And I would have to print that visit out and then have one of my staff would have to scan that into the electronic records. So now I have Zoom on one side of my computer. I have Epic over here. I have my microphone and I'm talking and dictating as I go along, making sure the patient understands what we're saying. So it's really kind of seamless. Uh, we've created a template. And if you have you know, care everywhere, you can reach out for those. We have a, vi a virtual visit template that we've created. And we're trying to tweak that with the new guidelines. But yeah, it's very, very, in my mind, kind of mm -hmm. seamless. I think the challenge, like you said, is not all of our colleagues are going to have Epic or have the Zoom that's available. So some of these options that are ready to go out of the box, things like, you know, doxy.me or some other ones, like even American Well, that patient uh, physicians can use right off the bat. So both of you uh, who been, have been doing this for a while, every one of us or uh, the rest of us are struggling to catch up right now. And both of you have great lectures on the topic of telemedicine, tele telerheumatology. And you're really good at pitching the idea that this is the, maybe the future. This is important. Um, this works because it's convenient. It's time efficient. It's cost efficient. And you maintain privacy. But there are downsides to this. And I want you to discuss what the downside is of uh, telemedicine. Besides the electronics, the fact that most older white-haired <laughs> almost retiring rheumatologists, no-haired rheumatologists, my, my almost retiring are not good at electronics. 
um, and maybe this doesn't apply to all patients. What is the downside of, of telehealth? Dan, you uh -huh. want to start with that? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Well, I think, the, I think the downside for me is the inability to examine them carefully. Um, I think that's been everyone's concern. And if you don't examine the patient physically uh, in any detail, then there's an anxiety level on the provider side that, that you're missing something. And that uh, is, you know, um, a portion of the patients where the um, exam is a crucial factor. It may be, I mean, in our studies, it was more like 20%. It wasn't huge, but it was enough to, that, to say, I'm not comfortable, you need to come in. And um, that's, I think, the biggest limitation from my standpoint. Alvin. So my thing is, it's is, is actually the patients, you know, we take a step back, even when we have introduced a patient, hey, I have a nurse practitioner, I have a physician assistant, they're just as good as me, we still sometimes get some pushback from the patients. And I'm really surprised, it's not always my older patients, they love the time, 30 minutes with the PA, but some of my younger patients get the pushback. So my older patients are happy, they can sit there on the phone, they can talk and they can go on and on and they love that kind of time. But I think it's one of getting buy-in from the patient side standpoint. Um, I am. I do think the good thing out of this is it's going to change how we practice in medicine in the future, that we will see this be a part of our medical care delivery system. I wish we get to the point that we did, that's so interesting, last year at ACR, the doctors in groups in Germany, that the doctor now can prescribe these apps. They, have a, they can prescribe the watch that's covered by the German insurance. They have an app that leaks into the clinic, and it's, they can monitor the blood pressure and all those different things. So the tools are there. We just need to get sophisticated to see who can cover those things and making sure that across the country that the internet access should not be an option. It would be something that's kind of standard. Because, uh, again, you talk about medicine, but even in our area, Chicago and Milwaukee, there are kids who can't do the homeschool because they don't have the internet. So Comcast and others are trying to come up with ways to cover some of these inner cities where they don't have all the, the, the virtual access. So but I think the biggest thing is the patient, getting a buy-in from them, and then eventually getting more and more uh, acceptance by the standard insurance companies as well. Let's end with the issue of new patients via telemedicine. You know, follow-ups are easier. You know the patient. You know their stories. Their exam might change. You know what to maybe expect there. But a new patient, you don't know. They come with, you know, it has it's vasculitis, it's lupus, it's everything that it probably isn't. Um, how do you handle telemedicine in new patients, Alvin? So first of all, Jack, that's how I love it the most, because I can tell you, I roughly see nine new patients a day. So my three, two PAC, three each, and I see three, but I see, I, I, they staff all the patients with me. Um, but I, I'm just overwhelmed by the number of patients I see that they really should not be in my clinic. So the patient who's had back pain for seven years, somebody does an a and on them, and say now that one to 80 a and is lupus that causes your back pain, you need to see Dr. Wells. And I get them in, we've got them on the schedule for 45 minutes, and it turns out in five minutes, I can say, you do not have lupus. That doesn't cause your back pain. So instead of wasting my time where I don't get paid for, I don't screen patients' visits. I say I have to come in. But now I love it for those new patients. So the scenarios, I order my blood work. I get my x-rays. If that set rate comes back at 80, the CRP comes back at 10. Uh, and then based on what they told me, I say, wow, you need to come in tomorrow for a physical visit. And I say, this is some issues that's going on. So I love it instead of screening, taking the time to screen people. I love it for the new patients because we all know that many people that are referred to us probably shouldn't be seen by rheumatology. Dan, what do you think? Um, so I have a very similar um, approach to it. If patients need to come down to our clinic, we pre-screen them and we reject about 90% uh, based on the same considerations that Alvin said. In telemedicine, I don't reject anybody. Um, so I see all of them by telemedicine and I do exactly what Alvin says. If they, if they, if they uh, look like they ha have an uh, inflammatory disease, if their labs are abnormal, I have them come down. So, so I think we have a very similar approach. It's just that we pre-screen our in, our in clinic visits to the point where I'm worried that we're missing things, you know? Hmm. So I'd this rather could, do the telemedicine. Exactly. This, so this could easily become an important part of the rheumatology uh, evaluation model. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this insight um, and making us smarter in this time of COVID. Um, hopefully we'll continue the discussion. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Alvin. Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. Take care now.